I will talk about it this evening. It, I think it's the first time I'm discussing this approach and I hope to continue the research uh, in Bonn in the coming two years. My lecture, therefore, is not going to be so much an overview of results and firm conclusions, rather it is one uh, presenting hypotheses and directions for future inquiry. The shift from print to digital records in public and private administrations, new practices of clerical work, distanced and accelerated by the pandemic, and the latest developments in the realm of artificial intelligence have all fueled a revival of both popular and academic interest in fictional narratives that engage with institutional writing, text processing, record keeping and information retrieval. Briefly put, stories about bureaucracy are making a loud comeback and so does a scholarship about them. Tonight I will spend the first part of my presentation explaining and exemplifying what I mean by bureaucratic fiction. I will then be speaking of the entanglements of bureaucracy and affects, seeing that, as you might have guessed from the title, I look at representations of bureaucracy through the lens of affect theory in the tradition of Sarah Ahmed, uh, Brian Masumi and Jan Slavi. Now, bureaucracy is already a word prone to trigger strong affective responses. It is universally loathed, despised, criticized, laughed at, and reviled, yet we maintain it and ensure its proliferation on a daily basis. Office work is anti-narrative in the sense that we often associate it with dullness, boredom, dread, repetition, redundancy, and monotony. However, it is frequently used as a setting for captivating thrillers, dark satire, terrifying dystopias, and light-hearted comedy. Its supposed neutrality and impersonality makes it malleable enough to accommodate a variety of aesthetic and affective regimes. The fact that this year's annual theme of the Institute happens to be economy, a term rooted in the Greek oikonomia, meaning household management, reminded me that bureaucracies, much like economies, produce, circulate and exchange material as well as virtual goods. They create and trade in various forms of inscription for purposes of managing and keeping track of individuals, communities and entire societies. Public and private bureaucracies shape and are shaped by material economies, but also by affective economies, a concept which I um, hopefully explain in a third section. And finally, the last segment engages with Michel Foucault and his concept of the administrative grotesque as an example of bureaucratic affective economy. Scholars have long tried to make sense of this thematic tradition uh, in different forms and have theorized a number of subgenres, if you will, uh, independently for, from one another. You are, of course, familiar with bureaucratic dystopia, a construct playing on what Huxley termed the administrative nihilism. Then we have Professor Rudiger Campes' concept of the institutional novel, Institu Institution and Roman a concept he develops in relation to Robert Musil's Man Without Qualities. A contemporary iteration of that institu institutional roman, a novel, sorry, uh, would be Alex, what Alex Radisoglu terms the EU novel, namely uh, the novels engaging with the workings of the European bureaucracy in Brussels. And there is also a bureaucratic fantasy, which Damien Walter calls bureaucracy. Um, the bureaucrat comedy theorized by Laura Zoe Humphreys, and more generally the administrative novel uh, explored by scholars such as Egger, McDaniel, and Waldo. In his Utopia of Rules, uh, Gra David Graeber proposes and then refutes such concepts as bureaucratic narrative and anti bureaucratic narrative. So, although I'm inspired by all of these concepts. I found none of them actually suiting my purposes here because I wanted to describe a transmedia cross-genre narrative mode that I ident identified in literature as well as in film, in comedies as well as in dystopias. In other words, I found these categories to be too narrow to describe the fic fictional phenomenon that interests me. 
So in order to overcome these limitations, I propose the concept of bureaucratic fiction, which I hesitate to call an autonomous genre, simply because it manifests itself in multiple genres, as we have seen. I see it rather as a thematic domain deploying shared conventions, imageries, and tropes, with which you are surely familiar, for example, the labyrinth and the associated uh, sense of confusion and disorientation, the sense of bureaucratic malaise, uh, the monstrous accumulation of paperwork, the image of a cog in an inhuman machinery, so on and so forth. In the works I'm looking at, bureaucracy is the main theme, uh, the main setting, and its procedures are an important plot-advancing narrative device. These narrative arcs are modulated by different affective regimes and aesthetic categories, playing out as comedy, satire, drama, thriller, dystopias, fantasy, and many others. Bureaucratic fiction is also adaptable to multiple formats and media, from short stories to video games, from epic novels to TV series. Uh, in my talk today, I will only focus on uh, novels and cinema. It is also not limited to a single literature or a cultural space, which is why I engage with an international corpus of works. I look at bureaucratic fiction through a particular angle, which is informed by a previous research project, which I'm hoping to complete soon. Uh, it has this title, <laughs> uh, which I won't read out loud because it's just too clunky. Um, but my interest here lies above all in institutional writing practices, in the mechanisms through which we invest writing with life-regulating power, and in the portraits of the employees performing or handling this writing. Copies, archivists, office clerks, scriveners, data entry operators, and so on. A type of character that Cornelia Wiesmann has called pure recording entities. There is also a meta-narrative angle, if you will, attached to this project, addressing larger questions that look at literature as an institution performing a non-mandated and unsystematic form of record-keeping, a sort of figurative archive of mankind, if you will. Then the work of the literary writer is not so much different to that of a bureaucrat. Their writing impacts the world by way of technologies of inscription and practices of encoding and decoding of experience, operating within pragmatics of its own, rules and procedures, protocols, uh, codes of conduct, uh, and many others. All of these are invested with symbolic power through social conventions. In short, I'm fascinated by bureaucratic stories and paperwork as modes of textual and non-textual inscriptions. Nowadays, we perhaps also call this writing content generation or data entry. In any case, they all share a common faith in uh, the logocentric authority. My work could perhaps be inscribed in a larger transcultural history of bureaucratic characters that may jokingly extend from Bartleby the Scrivener to the contemporary uh, data entry operator. But that is, of course, a project that exceeds the abilities of an individual scholar. For the moment, with my upcoming research in Bonn, I hope to create a comprehensive inventory of titles that could profitably enter this history, gathered from as many literatures as possible, and your suggestions for it are always welcome. Although one could surely trace earlier examples of bureaucratic fiction, it booms in the Western canon with the creation of nation states and the inevitable associated administrative apparatus in the 19th century. You recognize many of the classics here, Kleist, Balzac, Dickens, Melville, Rabe, Flaubert, Huysmans, they have all engaged with this topic. The theme, the theme proliferates in early 20th century when it also gains a wider range of aesthetic treatments. It is a time for realism as well as parables, for the absurdities of war bureaucracy as well as for scenarios of totalitarian rule. The project I'm hoping to complete soon uh, looks at, at post-war 20th century bureaucratic fiction in novels and film. And the corpus includes Maurice Blanchot's novel Le Tréau, um, Stanislav Lem's Memoirs Found in 
the bathtub, but also Ismail Kadare's The Palace of Dreams and Saramago's novel All the Names. In cinema, I look at Orson Welles' adaptation of The Trial, um, preceded by Akira Kurosawa's Ikiru, a very early work after the war, but also Thomas Gutierrez Alea, La Muerte de un Burócrata, a Cuban a bureaucratic comedy, and of course, Terry Gilliam's uh, Brazil. Before I move on to the 21st century, another example worth mentioning would be the Dutch epic novel Het Bureau by Johannes Jacobus Bosquil, which has been luckily translated into German, and I'm hoping an editor somewhere has already commissioned an English translation. I have chosen the year 2000 in my categorization as a symbolic, though not terribly accurate, moment of a split between print and digital record keeping. Um, these two screenshots illustrate, I think, uh, the difference between the two. Um, there are now fewer human employees, more automatic workflows, a, change, a visible change in material infrastructure and in aesthetics, but a similar emphasis on numbing repetition and uniformity that seems to expand indefinitely. Changes in technology also bring out a paradigm shift from the moral economy of high modernism to the high-tech modernism. James C. Scott uses the first term in his book, Seeing Like a State, to describe a certain brand of optimism specific to the 20, 20th century about the possibilities for the comprehensive planning of human settlement and production. For high modernists, believers in the utopia of perfect ordering and rationalization, order is described in remarkably visual aesthetic terms. Notice the geometry of the space, the symmetry, the perfect alignment of the units. With the advent of the digital age, however, the, the same belief in the perfect systematization of the world um, endures but in a different form, uh, which authors like Henry Farrell and Marion Fourcade have called high-tech modernism. Briefly put, this describes the convergence of bureaucracy and computation, or in other words, and I quote from their article here, the application of machine learning algorithms to organize our social, economic, and political life. Unlike their paper-pushing predecessors in bureaucratic institutions, the humans of high-tech modernism disappear be behind an algorithmic curtain. The workings of algorithms are much less visible, even though they penetrate deeper into the social fabric uh, than the workings of bureaucracies. The development of smart environments and the, the Internet of Things has made the collection and processing of information about people too comprehensive minutely geared, inescapable, and fast-growing for considered consent and resistance." End quote. With this in mind, let's move to some examples of contemporary bureaucratic fiction, such as David Foster Wallace's The Pale King, a monumental though unfinished collection of vignettes uh, populated by pale bureaucrats working for the American Internal Revenue Service or um, Helen Phillips is the beautiful bureaucrat um, following the job interview and employment of a woman data entry clerk working for a mysterious database. I will be happy to talk more about this novel in the workshop tomorrow morning. Another example is the stinging office satire um, which Robert Manas deploys in the capital, a novel that turns Brussels into a fun house of nonsensical regulations and embarrassing acronyms on the occasion of the European Commission's 50th anniversary, in direct reference to the institutional anniversary Musil unpacks in The Man Without Qualities. In the highly gendered landscape of bureaucratic narratives, a lesser known example engaging with the text processing work of a woman bureaucrat is Liliana Korovka's The Censor's Notebook, a Romanian novel dealing with communist era censorship that has recently come out in English translation. And you might be familiar with this one, Olga Ravn's The Employees, a workplace novel of the 22nd century. Um, which has 
enjoyed a lot of fame recently and adds a post-human perspective to the field with fragmented testimonies from the artificial intelligence workforce. Ben Winters, on the other hand, dwells in the golden state on a full-fledged dystopic scenario in which every individual is mandated by the state to keep minute records of their every word and action. Although it's arguably not a great novel, I find this idea of a generalized, self-administered uh, bureaucracy to be particularly intriguing. Finally, one more novel about a middle-aged uh, Brussels Eurocrat working at the European Commission, this time a statistician tasked with sketching scenarios for the future. For anyone doubting the extent of effective labor in bureaucratic work, I find it very telling that this novel has the title that it does. Um, moving on to bureaucratic fiction in film. Uh, the first two decades of the 21st century have been quite prolific and brought some distinct trends. Um, it suffices to think of The Office in either British or American version or Mad Men to notice an increasing serialization. A second trend consists of remakes um, that may or may not cross cultural borders. Just last year we had Kugosawa's EQ um, remade in the UK, uh, it maintains its setting in the 1950s, but it moves from Tokyo to London. But of course, there are lots of remakes within a single cultural space as well, as it is the case of Armando Janucci's The Thick of It, mocking British public administration in the tradition of the two BBC series from the 80s, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. The most recent and a personal favorite, uh, which I also look forward to discussing in tomorrow's workshop, is Apple TV's Severance, a corporate sci-fi taking issue with the concept of the perfect work-life balance. Here, a biotech company inflicts a severance procedure on volunteering employees to maximize productivity and ensure workplace secrecy. The procedure consists of a brain surgery that permanently separates the professional self from the private self, erasing any personal memories in the workplace and any work memories in the personal time. In practice, this translates to working selves feeling forever trapped at work, since they cannot remember anything else, where they have to repeat emotionally draining and repetitive tasks. The labor is effective before all else. Uh, they have to sort numbers on a screen based on how the numbers feel to them. Acts of rebellion are punished with mental torture and mock therapy sessions where the clerks are encouraged to enjoy every statement equally. Uh, the imagery of literal workplace torture is also deployed in Terry Gilliam's Just as Dystopian Brazil, where machine-typed documents work to create a monstrous paper double of reality. Everything is scrupulously documented in, in duplicates and triplicates, later available to the Ministry of Information for information retrieval. There is a receipt for every receipt and a stenogram for every cry of pain. Um, like its 20th, 20th century counterpart, the bureaucratic subject on, of the 21st century is a complicated creature. As the novels and films I have talked about consistently demonstrate, the contemporary bureaucrat defies and subverts Max Weber's ideal of a perfectly dispassionate uh, administrative system. Speaking of which, I will take you down uh, this street and take a look at his uh, dedicated chapter on bureaucracy in um, economy and society, where he describes the ideal model of a bureaucracy. According to Weber, uh, bureaucracy develops the more perfectly, the more it is dehumanized, the more completely su succeeds in eliminating from official business love, hatred, and all purely personal, irrational, and emotional elements which escape calculation. So we have a full uh, dismissal of affects. This is appraised as its special virtue by capitalism. He also talks about objectivity as opposed to personal discretion and grace. 
he mentions regular disciplinary procedures as a cure for arbitrary dispositions trickling down the hierarchical ladder. Interestingly, and anticipating an argument later made by Eva Illouz about the capitalization of emotion, he also notices, and I quote, an irresistibly expanding bureaucratization of all public and private relations of authority, and sees how this extends way outside the office space, affecting the most intimate aspects of personal culture, end quote. So rather than embodying the dispassionate ideal of Weberian bureaucrat, the emerging bureaucrat subject of the 21st century seems to be a medium through which affects intersect with economic production, circulation and exchange. Eva Luz and Josef Vogel, a distinguished fellow this year at uh, the Institute, present two such models of subjects. Uh, one is the homo sentimentalis, Evaelus talks about in cold intimacies, the making of emotional capitalism. The other is, of course, uh, homo economicus, the overlap of which I also hope to make a uh, subject for tomorrow's discussion. There is much to unpack, therefore, in terms of an affective economy in bureaucratic fiction. The concept itself is soon going to be 20 years old, uh, dating back to an eponymous article by Sarah Ahmed, um, where she dwells on the social circulation of private emotions such as hate or, or fear. For her, and I quote, in affective economies, emotions do things, and they align individuals with communities or bodily space with social space. Rather than seeing emotions as psychological dispositions, we need to consider how they work in concrete and particular ways to mediate the relationship between the psychic and the social, and between the individual and the collective." End quote. She adds that affects are economic in the sense that they do not reside in a given subject or object, but circulate among signifiers. In an analogy with the Marxian critique of capital, Ahmed formulates a theory of emotion as economy, noting that emotions work as a form of capital. Affect does not reside positively in a sign or, com or commodity, but it is produced only as an effect of its circulation. Later, her take will be reevaluated by Lehmann, uh, Roth, and Schankweiler in a chapter titled Affective Economy in the book whose cover you see on the screen. The authors argue that while Ahmed correctly identified affective economy as an analytical tool to describe the creation of collective identities, more work must be done to emphasize the role of the media involved in this creation, considering that media organize processes of exchanging and sharing affects. So for them, the concept of affective economy focuses more narrowly on the exchange and circulation of affects through media, which they also see as being inherently political, leading to various articulations of dissent, commonality, and belonging. But dissent, commonality, and belonging also shape narrative arcs that the individual bureaucrat follows in the workplace, juggling uh, complicated hierarchies of distributed servitude and authority, obedience and disobedience. Finally, uh, we get to the last point of my talk, uh, Foucault's concept of the administrative grotesque, developed in his uh, lectures on the concept of abnormal, delivered in Paris in the mid-70s. Here's the exact quote. Um, I won't read the entirety of it, just skim through. Uh, he says that political power gives itself the possibility of conveying its effects, and even more of finding their source, in a place that is manifestly, explicitly, and readily discredited as odious, despicable, or ridiculous. This grotesque mechanism of power, or this grotesque cog in the mechanism of power, has a long history in the structures and political functioning of our societies. He also notes that the grotesque is not an accident, but rather one of the consistent essential processes of arbitrary sovereignty, a process also inherent to assiduous bureaucracy. 
Since the 19th century, an essential feature of big Western bureaucracies has been that the administrative machine, with its unavoidable effects of power, works by using the mediocre, useless, superficial, ridiculous, worn-out, poor and powerless functionary. The administrative grotesque has not been merely that kind of visionary perception of administration that we find in Balzac, in Dostoevsky, Kurtelin or Kafka. Rather, it is a, poss a real possibility for bureaucracy, and he uses uh, the figure of Ubu, the pen pusher, um, a functional component of modern administration, um, just as being in the hands of a mad charlatan was a function of Roman imperial power, and I end his quote here. And I have chosen to illustrate this, this um, concept of grotesque administrative authority figures with a screenshot from Monty Python's 1993 The Meaning of Life. Um, Foucault uses his concept as a category of social political analysis, but I suggest it is also an aesthetic category and an affective regime. As an aesthetic category, the grotesque involves nightmarish visions, weird shapes and distorted forms like we see in this painting and dancing, both taken from severance, uh, and which are both, by the way, allegories of the taming of the four tempers, uh, which again brings us to a discussion of affects and uh, internal management of emotion. The grotesque is also something that simultaneously el elicits a feeling of uncomfortable bizarreness as well as sympathetic pity. And in the top images, uh, I have selected two scenes from uh, Brazil and the trial, uh, which illustrate a common trope of bureaucratic fiction, uh, namely the crushing sense of this proportion uh, at play in uh, scenarios in which the low-ranking bureaucrat is set against the administrative apparatus to which uh, he belongs. The lower image reflects the same pro disproportion in scale between the workers and the institution, this time in severance, uh, where the institution, Lumon Industries, is personified by a portrait of its founder, who is revered with almost religious piety. The grotesque is at once strange, mysterious, magnif magnificent, fantastic, hideous, ugly, incongruous, unpleasant, and disgusting but it can also be funny, um, again, in a more humorous re register, the exaggerated obsession with scale as a metonymy for economic uh, expansion, also from the meaning of life. And to conclude, um, bureaucracy, which is in theory a dispassionate practice, as we have seen with Weber, not only holds space for affects, it is also able to accommodate contradictory affects simultaneously. The administrative grotesque as effective economy involves the paradoxical coexistence of humor and terror or horror, but also solemnity and ridicule in figures of administrative authority, the monstrous proliferation of bureaucratic processes, uh, including endless deferral, self-referentiality, infinite loops and vicious circles. Obscurity plays a role as well and confusion uh, in the labyrinthine structures of the institutions depicted, uh, who, which often work towards uh, secretive ends. But, and very often we see uh, deployed um, devilish Mephi Mephistophelic imagery in the portrayal of uh, high authority figures. There is also a bureaucratic sense of malaise. Um, workers here are often pale, um, sick, uh, feeling nauseated or just complaining of a nondescript discomfort from their office work. And as I have shown earlier, there, are, uh, there is this proportion, exaggerations in scale, um, which I illustrated with the low-ranking bureaucrat uh, confronting uh, a crushing, overpowering system. 
So situated at the intersection of capitalist labor practices, digital technologies and culturally determined affective regimes, the contemporary fictional avatars of the office worker are marked by the imperative of affectlessness, by a quasi-permanent state of discomfort, and by an increasing split between the private and the professional self. As Brian Masumi put it already in 1995, affect is an intrinsic variable of the late capitalist system in which it holds a key not only to swiftly accelerate or decelerate economic processes, but also helps in rethink, could help uh, in rethinking power outside of ideology. This is why I think it's necessary and important to take affect theory into account when looking at bureaucratic fiction, and I'm looking forward to talking more about it together. Thank you.